It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host David Feldman. Hello, David. How are you today? Very good. How was the benefit for Public Citizen? The benefit stand-up for Main Street was just a, a raging success out here in Los Angeles. For those of you who don't know, uh, we had Larry Miller and John Fugelsang, Cristela Alonzo and Rondell Sheridan. We had a great, it's comedy and inspiration in a very easy to digest package. So uh, we were very happy with that. So thanks for asking. What is Public Citizen? Public Citizen is, <laughs> as if you don't know, is the group that Ralph founded back in 1971. 48 years ago, and it has served the public interest and fighting corporate power and defending democracy for all those 48 years. So, Was that uh, before or after Ralph coined the phrase whistleblower? I don't know. Maybe we should ask the man himself, the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Yes, indeed. Why don't we ask the author of the book, Crisis of Conscience, who's going to be with us for most of the hour, Tom Muller. Correct. On the show today, we're going to talk about a topic and a word that has been in the news a lot lately in many different contexts. We're going to talk about whistleblowing, whether it's in the political realm or the corporate realm. We are seeing how important it is to engage and protect whistleblowers. And our guest today is Nay Muller. No, not that Muller. Another Muller who is a little less cryptic than old Bobby Three Sticks. We're going to be, <laughs> we're going to be speaking with Thomas Muller, who has written a book entitled Crisis of Conscience, whistleblowing in an age of fraud. In the book, Mr. Mueller argues that we live in an age of astonishing corruption, but it is also a golden age of whistleblowing. He researched the book by talking to over 200 whistleblowers and lawyers and many other experts like intelligence officials, politicians, government watchdogs, and even cognitive scientists. It's a full and comprehensive picture of the courageous act that helps us preserve our democracy. We'll be spending the bulk of the show with Thomas Muller and then take a short break to check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, who's done his own fair show celebrating whistleblowers. Then we'll fill out the rest of the hour posing your questions to Ralph. We've got some really good ones this week. But first, let's hear about the brave souls who have blown the whistles on corruption. David? Thomas Muller is a freelance writer of nonfiction and fiction. His work has appeared in The New Yorker. National Geographic Magazine, New York Times Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and elsewhere. His first nonfiction book, Extra Virginity, is a New York Times bestselling account of olive oil culture, history, and crime. His latest is Crisis of Conscience, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Thomas Muller. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Welcome indeed, Thomas Muller. This book reads like a mystery, but it's real. A lot of stories, gripping stories. You can read it in parts. You can spend an entire day going through its over 400 pages. He's interviewed a lot of people, and it shows. But for our listeners who have a vague concept of whistleblowing, that is, they could describe it in three, four sentences, I want to read an excerpt from page 42 that will really frame it so we can get in deep and expect a framework of comprehension by people who are not steeped in the whole whistleblower struggles that are all over the country and in the courts and in the press. Here's the excerpt, quote, this is the age of the whistleblower. Over the past two decades, continuing legal and social trends that originated in the late 1960s, a vital new figure has emerged. The insider who reveals malignant behavior by his organization, earning a measure of protection from the law, and of acceptance, even acclaim, from society. In lawsuits that grow more numerous every year, private anti-fraud whistleblowers have disclosed crimes by Fortune 500, healthcare companies, banks, automakers, and weapons manufacturers. Government whistleblowers have unmasked wrongdoing throughout federal, state, and local government, dishonest meat grading at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, theft of revenue from oil contracts in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, hazards at nuclear facilities like Los Alamos and Hanford, violation of mine safety standard that killed hundreds of miners, malfeasance by U.S. Marines procurement officials that killed hundreds of frontline soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan, civil servants at the Environmental Protection Agency, Homeland Security, the Department of the Interior, and the White House 
have revealed what they see as systemic betrayals of the legal mission of their offices. In fact, Thomas Muller continues, in fact, whistleblowing as an essential fraud-fighting paradigm is one of the few things that liberal and conservative lawmakers can agree on. Each year, Congress passes new whistleblower laws, which frequently improve job protection and offer large money incentives to encourage employees in an ever wider sphere of the public and private workplace to step forward. End of quote. But indicating how deep this book is, Tom says something else two pages later. Quote, but ultimately, as we'll see, the power of whistleblowers is often illusory. Their rise is a symptom of a society in deep distress. We are in the midst of a battle over whistleblowing, part of a larger struggle between personal conscience and group solidarity, between the rights of individuals to know what their corporations and their government are doing, and the ever greater power of organizations to keep their secrets. How these conflicts are ultimately resolved will say much about the future strength of our democracy. End quote. Now, in your book, Tom, you open with a long description of a struggle by quite a heroic person, an unlikely person, whose name is Alan Jones, and who is an investigator at the State Office of the Inspector General in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And one of the points you make is about Johnson & Johnson, which the record has shown over the years as a recidivist corporate criminal gets caught long after it's made huge profits on hazardous drugs, for example, pays what appears to be a big fine or tort law verdict or settlement, ends up ahead and keeps doing it. So let's delve in to the saga of Alan Jones and the Harrisburg authorities in Pennsylvania and Johnson & Johnson. Yes, Ralph. Alan Jones is an inspiration and I think a perfect example for me why I started off the book of both public and private whistleblowing. I mean, he was a public employee who worked at the Office of the Inspector General in Pennsylvania, and he discovered what he thought was wrongdoing. The big pharma companies were paying the state pharmacist money that was being put into an unmarked account, and that's a felony offense in Pennsylvania. So he went into action and he began to look into why they were paying the state pharmacist. And ultimately, he uncovered a multi-billion dollar fraud scheme during which Johnson & Johnson and other pharmaceutical companies were basically corrupting the public officials that ran Medicare and Medicaid in over a dozen states and essentially forcing them to put their antipsychotic drugs as the first treatment for a wide range of ailments many of which the FDA had specifically forbidden them from using. For instance, in the case of Risperdal, which is Johnson & Johnson's antipsychotic drug, they had specifically forbidden the use of Risperdal in any but adult schizophrenics. They had said no to children, no to elders, no to a wide range of people. Well, Johnson & Johnson was ignoring that and suborning state officials in, in over a dozen states to sell that drug to precisely those people who are quite often captive audiences. They were in reform schools, in prisons, in state hospitals. They didn't have a choice in what they were getting. And needless to say, those drugs were also vastly more expensive than the first generation antipsychotics. And so Johnson and Johnson and others were literally making a killing, figuratively with a lot of money, but literally because of the side effects were quite often extremely serious and sometimes lethal. Now, Alan Jones had a long background. He was a parole officer specializing in people with drug addiction problems and difficult childhoods. He really had a way of identifying with these people who were being victimized by this big pharma fraud scheme. He was able to see past the, the rhetoric and the cant and see there were real victims here. So he started investigating. He went to the headquarters of Johnson & Johnson and other companies and asked some sharp questions and began to get answers about this plan. I think they thought he was just an innocent paper pusher and wasn't going to cause them problems. Well, he went back home and started putting together what looked to him like a fraud scheme. Unfortunately, his own officials, his own bosses in the inspector general's office started clamping down on him because they said, these big pharma companies have huge political power and they write checks to both sides of the aisle. 
Tom Ridge was the governor, the new governor in Pennsylvania, and he had very strong corporate ties. And they basically tried to shut his investigation down. So Alan Jones fought back. He filed a First Amendment whistleblower lawsuit against his own office of the inspector general, whose mission, as he pointed out, was to inspect and root out fraud wherever it was found. That was to the detriment of the people of Pennsylvania. This was brought by a pro bono law firm? He correct. Didn't have to pay. Yeah. No, that's correct. The Government Accountability Project and other lawyers created a pro bono project to defend Allen, and their help and their support was fundamental in just keeping him on his feet. And at the same time, he brought another suit under a key TAM provision of a state whistleblower law in Texas, basically the state version of the False Claims Act. And the key TAM provision is this beautiful mechanism in law, really codified under Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, but dating back to medieval common law, in which an individual citizen can become a private attorney general and bring suit on behalf of the American people, even when the Department of Justice or the U.S. government is not interested in taking part. And of course, that's very handy when you have very politically powerful players who might well convince the government not to take part. So Alan Jones, for years, lived in a deer hunting cabin in the woods in Pennsylvania. He had no job. He had no money barely enough money to pay for the propane for his cabin and a new set of tires for his pickup truck. But he finally found someone who would listen in the state of Texas and the Texas Attorney General took his case and a very good law firm, Fish Richards in Dallas, became his advisors. And eventually he won a settlement against Johnson & Johnson after three days of trials in which some remarkably damning evidence was brought out and won a settlement of $158 million, which led years later to the global DOJ settlement with Johnson Johnson of $2.2 billion. But Ralph, as you pointed out, in the course of the marketing of Risperdal, Johnson Johnson made what was estimated to be something like $24 billion. So ultimately, these settlements, as Alan Jones himself recognized, really felt like the cost of doing business, not like real justice. And the people who suffered from these drugs ultimately got no retribution at all. They were not even taken into account in the lawsuit. So Alan has a good feeling about having won his case, but not a good feeling about ultimate justice being done. It's even worse. In your book on page 39, you say, Johnson & Johnson admitted no wrongdoing in these cases, accepted no liability. None of its employees were prosecuted. It's because the settlements with all these states, Johnson & Johnson's corporate lawyers would say, okay, we'll agree to this modest amount to spare you all kinds of litigation years. And you know, you don't have the staff in the attorney general's office to combat our corporate lawyer mega firms. However, we want you to agree to write in the settlement that our client, Johnson & Johnson, admits no wrongdoing and accepts no liability. So this is an example of the double standard, listeners, between corporate crooks and ordinary people who might forge a $300 check or ordinary people who might forge a $300 check out of desperation or have a, a tiny bit of marijuana in their pocket in a state where marijuana is illegal. So how do you deal with this structured immunity and impunity and start with your view of corporate law firms representing these corporate crooks. I want to hear what all these interviews and all this research, Tom, has led you to conclude about the least examined power brokers in our country that are the architects of immunity by their corporate crook clients, the corporate law firms. Let's start with them. Yes. Well, I took a page from your book and learned a great deal about the notion of law in the public interest. And this is law in the public disinterest. The number of white collar defense lawyers who do their tour of duty in the Department of Justice and then move smoothly, seamlessly over to the other side of the table and begin to defend the very people they've learned about how to prosecute for 10 times the amount, 10 times the money, or the Mary Jo Whites or the Eric Holders who cycle in and out of government, but really ultimately home back into home base. And they even call it, this is my home in friendly interviews. 
it's a fundamental conflict of interest. This revolving door business is so clear. A moderately gifted eight-year-old would tell you, hmm, I don't think this is going to work out so well. They're going to be thinking about their next paycheck and their former clients. How can they be objective? Well, it's only the clever careerists and technocrats who have convinced us and themselves that they can manage this conflict of interest. This is part of the reason why I went deeply into social psychology and evolutionary psychology at points in my book, because we know these things. We have this data. This science is settled. People are not able to handle these kinds of severe conflicts of interest because much of those conflicts work their way out in the unconscious. And it is perfectly natural for people to home in on their friends, former and future. Perfectly natural. One great social scientist, Elliot Aronson, put it to me, a person turns towards their source of funding as a flower turns towards the sun. And I think that's a, just a very natural, almost biological reality. We choose to ignore it, but at our great peril. And the people, the architects of this settlement with, with Johnson & Johnson and the state of Texas, the national settlement, they were former and future white collar defense lawyers with a brief term in the DOJ. And they never even considered prosecuting Alex Gorsky, who was in fact the architect of the Risperdal marketing plan. He's now the CEO of the company. There's a fundamental problem here. And as one Texas lawyer told me, you know, until we start folks out with orange jumpsuits, we're not gonna get justice. And I think that's perfectly clear. If you can write a settlement check, pass that along to your shareholders, keep your beach house and continue with business as usual, no one's going to stop. And Ellen Jones loses his job and is permanently unemployed, but the architects and the executors of this heinous mar drug marketing plan were promoted, sometimes to the head of their organization. But the bright light in your book is the 1986 False Claims Act, which flowed from a lot of civic group, I might add, our groundbreaking conference on whistleblowers in January 1971, which is converted into a book called Whistleblowing. We had whistleblowers from government, unions, corporations, universities. And I, I looked out at that sea of conscience as people who take their conscience to, to work every day. And I said, well, something has to be done. But along came John Phillips, who was a public interest lawyer, and he lobbied Republican Senator Grassley in the Senate and Congressman Howard Berman, Democrat in the House, to pass this 1986 False Claims Act, one consequence of which is Alan Jones got part of the bounty, and he's no longer in a state of semi-deprivation and penury. So why don't you describe this 1986 act, what's happened since, and how it's constantly under attack? Yes. As an aside, your conference on professional responsibility, January 30th, 1971, is a red letter day for whistleblowing. And I think you're rightly recognized as having helped to recoin the term in a positive sense and underscore that professional responsibility, as many whistleblowers will say, just doing my job is a fundamental <laughs> undertaking that in a sense, we shouldn't even need the word whistleblower. People should really just do their jobs better. And I think whistleblowers are the first to say that. But thank goodness we do have whistleblower legislation now when corruption is so endemic. The 1986 amendments to the False Claims Act basically brought back to life a law that had been passed under Abraham Lincoln in 1863 at the height of the Civil War. Lincoln and a set of senators became aware that, surprise, surprise, military contractors were robbing the Union Army blind. And in response to this, they passed the False Claims Act which allowed an, an individual with good facts to step forward and become a private attorney general and bring suit against those contractors or anyone who presented a false claim for payment to the US government and receive a bounty if they were successful. Now, during World War II, that law was hamstrung systematically by the defense contractors, another big surprise. But in 1986, in, in the era of Caspar Weinberger's $640 toilet seat, and a period of time in which defense contractors, all the major defense contractors were under multiple investigation. There was a groundswell of support for the reenactment of these laws that, as you said, Ralph, John Phillips was able to coalesce an amazing, unlikely coalition of people 
Chuck Grassley in the Senate and Howard Berman in the House, who maybe didn't agree on much else, but they certainly agreed that waste, fraud, and abuse and misconduct were to be punished, and that we needed this bounty provision more than ever to incentivize people to come forward. And it, they successfully reenacted this law and gave it teeth, gave it significant teeth. And the False Claims Act today is far and away the Department of Justice's most effective weapon in fighting corporate fraud, far and away. Since 1986, we have recovered something on the order of $60 billion in ill-gotten tax dollars. And we've helped to prevent an estimated trillion dollars more in fraud because people are always looking over their shoulder now and saying, anyone in this office could become a whistleblower. So the, the False Claims Act is, is a remarkable success. Well, we're talking with Tom Muller, the author of Crisis of Conscience, a book that's being talked about all over the country. The subtitle is Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud. And by the way, David, if, if this is enough interest to you, I know you have a culinary desire for olive oil when you eat. And Tom Muller is an expert on olive oil. That was his first book. Tell us, Tom, about the gripping story in a chapter five called Reaping the Nuclear Harvest. Listen to this. Well, Hanford Nuclear Reservation is one of the most dangerous and polluted places on Earth. It's certainly the most polluted place in the Western Hemisphere. It's where all of the plutonium was made for the U.S.'s nuclear arsenal. It was begun in the heat of World War II and had a secrecy that exceeded the Normandy invasion. It was so tightly held, the information about how plutonium was being made was so tightly held that it was, that was more secret than Operation Overlord. At any rate, in the 70s and early 80s, the production of new plutonium was phased out and a new era at Hanford began, one of nuclear cleanup. Now, nuclear cleanup, just like nuclear production, is an enormous possibility for a boondoggle by government contractors, many of whom, Bechtel, URS, Honeywell, are on the government contractors database for recidivist fraud. You can see their names right up there with Lockheed and Johnson & Johnson. And in the last 30 years, as the cleanup has proceeded, and the cleanup, I should add, is, is of vital importance to our nation, not only to people who are downstream of the Columbia River where the plants are located, but also for the entire Pacific Northwest, because as these World War II era facilities age and are crippled by their own radioactivity, the risk becomes greater and greater of a criticality, as the technicians would say, or in layman's terms, a mushroom cloud over the Tri-Cities. So Donna Bushy and Walt Tamasitis were two highly skilled, highly trained nuclear engineers who worked at Hanford. They were working on a project, a major new nuclear waste disposal facility, which was to deal with the most dangerous high-level waste on the facility, which, let me tell you, is, is the most dangerous material that we know of in the Western Hemisphere. Only the Russians can compete. And very late in the project, as this plant began to approach completion, both Walt and Donna began to see that there were serious, serious technical problems, serious problems with the quality of the materials that have been used, serious problems with the fundamental chemistry and physics of this plant. And as with all whistleblowers that I know, they first surfaced their concerns through channels. They went to their bosses and their bosses' bosses. Then they went to the Department of Energy regulators who should be riding herd on this whole thing, but who are completely captured by the government contractors. When they got nowhere, they took the dramatic step that true whistleblowing requires of going outside their organization, of getting out of the trap of channels. They went to safety, nuclear safety activists, they went to the press, they went to lawyers, and they ultimately filed suit. Now, they did successfully stop this plant in its tracks, this multi-billion dollar plant, for which taxpayers have been bled white over the years. They did reveal multi-billion dollar fraud in the process for which the contractors recently signed a settlement agreement on their False Claims Act case. But Walt and Donna are permanently out of a job. They're permanently blackballed in their industry, and they have never been replaced. And the people who 
facilitated or, and ran the fraud are thriving. Their careers have never missed a beat. So again, we have a situation in which people who do the right thing suffer career ending and life changing retaliation. Our listeners should also know that the metal tanks, the giant metal tanks containing these uh, plutonium lace wastes at Hanford in eastern Washington state have broken through over the years. The tanks, they're contaminating the land underneath it, which eventually will go into the Columbia River. And that's the great fear. And billions of your taxpayer dollars have been spent at Hanford, as well as other nuclear waste sites, to try to deal with this horrendous problem. You have a chapter called Money Makes the World Go Round, and you quote a Thomas Jefferson letter to John Taylor in 1816 that I wasn't aware of. And the quote is by Thomas Jefferson, quote, and I sincerely believe with you that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies, end quote. And also you quote James Galbraith testifying for the Senate saying, quote, at its heart, therefore, the financial crisis was a breakdown in the rule of law in America, end quote. Uh, He's speaking of the financial collapse of Wall Street on taxpayer backs in 2008-2009. Give us a thumb sketch of what you found in the chapter, Money Makes the World Go Round. Well, in essence, 2008 was, to borrow a, a phrase from the economist Simon Johnson, a silent coup. You know, we had the crash of 1929, we had the Great Depression, but then we had the New Deal. We had retribution and some measure of justice on Wall Street. We had Ferd Pecora, who grilled all the Wall Street titans and humiliated them in the press. And we had people going to jail for this, even in the savings and loan crisis, which is a fly spec compared to 2008. Over a thousand bank heads went to jail. 2008 was a little bit of a different picture. We had the people who had been the architects of this deregulation storm, the Robert Rubens and others in the White House of the Larry Summerses who brainstormed this deregulation under Clinton, then went on to profit mightily in the private sector from what they had wrought in the public sector, Citibank and elsewhere, hedge funds, coming back to the White House after 2008 to write the prescription for how to fix this. Not one senior banker was indicted. Not one senior banker was prosecuted. Not one senior banker saw a day of jail time. And yet our economy, still reeling from the structural damage that was done in 2008. And the stories that I tell of the people at various areas of the financial system, both at Citibank, in the SEC, and elsewhere, are are an interlocking indictment of the ways in which the key regulators had been captured. The Obama administration was clearly not interested in investigating specific people, specific firms, and the kinds of frauds that we all know now caused the 2008 collapse. Gross fraud by Wall Street banks and by upstream all the other layers of toxic mortgage creators and purveyors. We weren't interested in getting to the bottom of this because it would have been bad PR for the bailout scheme. Now, it makes me laugh when various Republicans decry socialism in all of its forms. And and they neglect to remember that a major standing army is, of course, a a significant socialist entity. But bailing out our banks and not demanding that they even give up their bonuses is the most egregious form of broken socialism that I've ever seen. Corporate immunity, again, and they're at it with very risky derivative speculation with other people's money uh, and some people predicting another crash. In your chapter, Ministries of Truth, you talk about William Edward Binney, B-I-N-N-E-Y, as one, quote, of the National Security Agency's greatest living code-breaking mathematicians and a world authority on mass surveillance. And he's been with the NSA since 1965. You couldn't have a more establishment figure. And tell us what happened to him. He received the Callaway Award for Moral Courage a few years ago. Tell us what happened to him and his partner, Whistleblower. This is one of the most amazing stories in your book. 
Yes, Bill Binney is, as you say, a, a lifetime high level member of the security establishment. You know, he, like many whistleblowers I inter- interviewed, is, is you know, um, from a military background, quite right wing, short haircut. Yes, sir. These are not liberal, crunchy granola sorts of individuals. They are very much rules people, and they're very much old-fashioned American values. And Bill Binney, in the run-up to the 9-11 attacks, became convinced that what he and his fellows were doing in the NSA under Michael Hayden not only consisted of a massive fraud against taxpayers to the tune of somewhere between eight and $13 billion, although no number has actually been pinned on it, because of course it's classified, but also actually compromised the American defense system to the extent that it facilitated the attacks of 9-11. So we not only lost billions of our tax dollars, but we actually helped the terrorists in the 9-11 attacks. And again, this is not the average American's view. This is the view of Bill Binney, Tom Drake, Diana Rourke, and others of their group, the group of five NSA lifers who had something like 150 years of experience between them, who came forward to the DOD IG, to the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, following protocol, following channels. They surfaced their complaints in a written whistleblower complaint to their Inspector General, much as the Ukrainian whistleblower has done uh, against Trump. Now, for their pains and for following the protocol and, and, and through channels, the DOD IG appears to have promptly handed their names over to the Department of Justice. The FBI kicked in their doors, pointed glocks at their faces, terrorized their families, subjected them to years of judicial retaliation. Tom Drake at one point faced 35 years in prison under Espionage Act charges. Of course, that all went away because there was no case. But the job was done. They were terrorized. They were permanently unemployed and unemployable. And ultimately, what often happens in whistleblower stories, the message was shifted from the data that they brought forward, which, of course, is still in a report that's been redacted and it's almost unintelligible. We need to know this information to the messenger. What were they up to? Were they spies? Were they traitors? And the U.S. establishment on both Republican and Democratic has become a master of shifting the debate to the point where the American people have lost track of what we're really talking about here. Those folks brought forward dead solid facts about matters of extreme national security and extreme fraud against the nation. And we still can't read that document. It is absurd. Not only that, but Benny and his colleagues were driven by their discovery inside the NSA that the NSA was engaged in dragnet snooping of all the people in our country, a violation of the Fourth Amendment to the nth degree. And he basically said to himself, that's not what I've signed up for. I didn't sign up for an agency to engage in dragnet surveillance without judicial warrant with these fancy computer systems of everybody in the country. So, you know, there was that aspect to it. What are they doing now? They haven't given up. No, they haven't given up. They've made a lot of noise about these whistleblower complaints. And at the same time, they continue, undoubtedly, with the sanction of major officials in the three branches of government to continue to this surveillance. Yeah, Bill Binney had the awful irony of having created this structure to surveil foreign targets and and winnow out in rapid, at top speed, potential terrorists. And seeing his own work, have the muffler and the, and the regulator turned off and being used against Americans, which is a thing that he had sworn every day of his working life not to do. He swore only surveillance on foreign targets. He swore to uphold the Constitution. So yes, he backed away from the agency when he felt that they were fundamentally violating their mission. And what would Edward Snowden take away from this message. If you follow protocol and you surface your concerns about mass surveillance, warrantless surveillance through channels, what happens to you? Well, all he had to do is look at Bill Binney and Tom Drake and see that his only hope of getting the word out was to take another route. And none of the perpetrators were ever punished in the NSA or other agencies of the government that collaborated with the persecution of these patriots. And by the way, listeners, there was a bread and butter aspect to this whistleblower Being a brilliant mathematician, Binney designed the surveillance system for 
about $360,000 he estimated it would cost. And he challenged the NSA alternative that was costing millions and millions of dollars and wasn't even doing as good a job. And he was proven right. Drake was proven right in blowing the whistle on waste, fraud, and abuse against the taxpayers. Even that bread and butter whistleblowing didn't insulate them from this kind of retaliation. Someone told me that after Drake was driven out and persecuted, even though he was proven right in the proceedings about the waste, fraud, and abuse, he was seen working in an Apple store in Washington to support his family. That's correct. I've met him several times in an Apple store. That's where he works. That's the only job he can get. I've met other whistleblowers who drive Uber who simply have been driven for doing the right thing and proving themselves to be ethical and right. And perhaps that's the worst of all. They were right. <laughs> and that makes them very, very awkward. But ultimately, loyalty and obedience are vastly more prized than justice and truth. And that's a sad statement. In your epilogue, Tom Muller, we're talking with Tom Muller, author of Crisis of Conscience, brand new book, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud. A lot of people are in working with big businesses who don't particularly respect the conscience of their workers as they violate the laws and moral principles. The epilogue, is this ever an enticing title? The Banana Republic wasn't built in a day, you say. What do you mean? Well, it's a funny thing. I had actually finished this book while Obama was still in office, more or less finished. And for various reasons, there was a delay. And then Trump got elected. And I had to write the epilogue to explain that all of the drivers that I had identified of whistleblowing, the actual social and economic and political forces that have brought whistleblowing to the fore, like unhealthy melding of public and private, like revolving door and other toxic forms of conflicts of interest, like cults of money, like cults of secrecy. All of these are embodied in Donald Trump. He is the walking, living, breathing, conflict of interest, unhealthy melding in public and private. And so I had to write this epilogue to say, no, look, folks, I wasn't actually writing this book about him. It just so happened that those factors emerged in my analysis. And sure enough, they come to fruition here. But the point of the banana republic not being built in a day, I tried there may not be any original analysis in my book, but I tried to connect a lot of dots. It took me about seven years overall to write this book. And I connected an enormous number of dots. And those dots lead from the last 50 years, certain institutional corruptions have become normalized. And we have accepted them as the way the game is played. And in fact, that even that terminology gives you a sense that we're looking at public life and private life as a game, not as coherent with our belief systems and our ethics, but as some kind of a game that needs to be played cleverly by clever people. We've gradually accepted this level of acceptance of white collar criminality as just one of the ways the game is played. And Russell Mulcaber and many others will tell you that white collar criminality is vastly more harmful to society than all the blue collar crime put together. It's just that it's unfortunate you have to prosecute the people who are your fellows at the country club. But if you look at what Donald Trump is today and his coterie of bandits that he's put in charge of our government, you can see the the price that is paid when you do not pay attention to recidivist white collar criminality over a generation or more. You get Donald Trump. And so that was my point that this is Donald Trump didn't come from Mars. He is the logical extension of the corruptions that we've allowed to creep into our political and social system. Well, Tom Muller, I wish you'd use the word corporate criminality instead of white collar. That's an old Mm -hmm. term that was used to not focus the American people on corporate crime. White collar crime really is when a bank teller cheats the bank, Mm -hmm. not when the bank cheats millions of consumers the way Wells Fargo has done. But one thing needs to be emphasized, a lot of these whistleblowers in your book, they were uncovering crimes. I mean, literal crimes. I mean, Bill Binney, when he blew the whistle, it wasn't just invoking the violation by the NSA of the Fourth Amendment, the right against search and seizure without judicial warrant. He was invoking the violation also of the FISA Act, Mm -hmm. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that provides a five-year jail term. It's a first-class felony if you, as a government official, spy on someone without a 
judicial warrant. And that's what I want to end this interview before I turn it over to David and Steve on page 537. By the way, listeners, you should really get this book not only for yourself, but also for your local library, because then all kinds of young people and not so young people can come and read it. And as you know, library budgets are pretty tight. Anyway, here's the way you end it. This is what I like about this book. It's not just a Pollyannish pan to whistleblowing as the cure-all. Let me quote you. For we cannot rely on a handful of whistleblowers alone to save our democracy. As Edward Snowden said in a 2015 interview, and you quote him, if we as a society are reliant on asking volunteers to stand up and self-immolate to report a wrongdoing, we will very quickly find ourselves out of volunteers. End quote, Edward Snowden. And then you continue. In a sense, the concept of blowing the whistle needs to disappear. It must become a routine act. Just as many whistleblowers consider it simply a part of working and living, right? The changes our society needs run deeper than better laws, regulations, compliance programs, and hotlines. We need to affirm the essential patriotism of dissent to celebrate sharp tongues and sovereign minds as our purest duties. Can this really be so hard in a nation that professes to revere its founders, those bold, rebellious, tirelessly provocative truth tellers? Question mark, end quote. Now, here's what everybody needs to keep in mind. Almost everything we like that we inherited from our forebears in our country started with dissent. Dissent is the mother of essent. The whole Bill of Rights, which I expect most people would assent to these days, freedom of speech, protection from search and seizure without judicial warrant, were controversial matters that started with dissenters like George Mason. And so if you keep that gigantic framework in mind, that almost all progress that changes the cruel status quo starts with dissent and whistleblowing is a form of conscientious dissent, we won't look at whistleblowing as kind of an outlier, as kind of an idiosyncratic leap into risk land by workers in big business and in government who take their conscience to work. Steve, David, jump yeah. in. I've got a question. How we've talked a lot about, and obviously in the news, the focus is on uh, the Donald Trump administration and whistleblowers and Trump calling them spies and treasonous. And how did the Obama administration treat whistleblowers? Well, in the corporate sphere, the Obama administration was supportive. Certain enhancements of corporate whistleblowing under the false claims, the, the Dodd-Frank whistleblower offices were aided. He had been a, a key TAM lawyer for a short time in private practice. He, he knew that world well. In the national security sphere, on the other hand, he was we will go down in history, perhaps, as the worst president ever, certainly the worst president so far in terms of weaponizing the Espionage Act and using it as a purely blunt force mechanism, a mechanism for shutting down discourse and intimidating people. You know, this is a, a 1917 law that was written to punish German spies during World War I. It's now being used by people who have absolutely nothing of a spy in them. They may disagree with their elders and betters, but they have, as Bill Binney and Tom Drake and countless others have shown, very good Doesn't evidence. it go back? Doesn't the espionage actually go back to John Adams? Well, I think, yes. I think originally- I mean, um, it's ingrained. It's part yes. of our heritage. Yes. It, it, shortly after the Declaration of Independence, we, <laughs> we have a retrenchment and an attack on anyone who might be cozy with the British. And yeah, there's, a, there's this two-faced nature in our stance towards whistleblowing, and it was very evident under Obama that we believe that whistleblowers are a good thing in other organizations. But people in our organization who are whistleblowers, we tend to think as traitors, spies, jerks, unstable individuals. We can't quite see that, hey, we need whistleblowers inside as well. And I think what Ralph says about dissent is fundamental. We need to rediscover and reemphasize the vital importance of disagreeing of not being a go-along-to-get-along personality, not being a good soldier, 
who executes orders no matter what. I mean, we've already worked that out in Nuremberg, right? And that's not yes. a good thing. Unquestioning uh, I just let me pause needs. here. Let's define for our listeners, Quitam. It's Q-U-I-T-A-M. It's a Roman name. Quickly define it. Quitam is a mechanism that was born in medieval common law, actually ultimately of Roman law roots. And it essentially allows, it stands for, it's a Latin phrase that stands for he who brings suit on his own behalf and on behalf of the king. And it was born at a time when the king of England did not have a standing police force to enforce all crimes. And so he relied on individual citizens to call out wrongdoing by their neighbors, by anyone that they noticed, and collect a reward for that. That was enhanced and inserted into the 1863 False Claims Act by Abraham Lincoln, and then otherwise known as the Lincoln Law. But it allows an individual citizen to prosecute a case on his own behalf as a private attorney general, but also on behalf of the entire U.S. government, even if the Department of Justice does not intervene. Good explanation. And you mentioned Nuremberg. I think a lot of officials now in the Trump administration, including the military, have got to bone up on the Nuremberg principles, which is if a boss, say the president, trying to do wag the dog at a time of impeachment crisis, tells the military to fire, if they think it's an illegal order, they are bound by international law to ignore it. So right. I think this has got to be part of the regular reporting of newspapers on the impeachment courses of action that are being taken, because if, if Trump becomes really desperate, he's going to start giving diversionary and distracting and perhaps horrendously risky orders to his military or to other officials. And they have got to realize that they are perfectly in their proper behavior to ignore that order if they believe it is illegal under our constitution or under international law. Explain the origin of the Nuremberg principles. Well, that's exactly right, Ralph. They are not only in their rights, but obliged not to obey illegal orders. The Nuremberg principles essentially were a way of dealing with Nazi oligarchs, higher ups in the Nazi administration, who basically said, look, we were following the orders of our supreme leader, our, our Fuhrer. And at the same time, which exonerated them in their minds from culpability in killing 7 million Jews and untold other millions. And the principle was codified that you cannot escape responsibility for your acts because of a higher authority. At the same time, the people on the ground who are executing those orders could not shift their responsibility to their superiors. Now, the sad thing, of course, is that it's still this game that we play of superiors being out of the loop and not knowing what their lower downs were doing, and the people actually executing the illegal orders blaming their wrongdoing on their bosses just following orders. That was replayed to great success during My Lai trials. Only a short time later in Vietnam, this horrible massacre in which a lot of people were arrested and tried, but fundamentally only one person was put in jail for any time and he was ultimately exonerated. Just let me interrupt here. Justice Jackson, who was a Supreme Court justice on leave at the time of the Nuremberg trials, and he presided in Germany over the Nuremberg trials. At the end, he said to the American people, don't think that these Nuremberg rules only apply to foreigners. They apply to people in the United States. Yes, indeed. And Timothy Snyder's book on tyranny, a wonderful book of 20 questions for the modern world, is a brilliant synoptic look at what happened in the rise of Hitler and the rise of Stalin on the one hand, and what's happening in our democracy today, and how those two things are disturbingly similar in many ways. It can happen here, as the book says. On that note, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Tom Muller, author of Crisis of Conscience, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud, a spectacular book that should be in every library in the country, in addition, as part of living room discussions and town meetings, because it's the ultimate protection against wrongdoing. It may not be the only protection that we can rely on, given how government and corporations are corrupted but it certainly deserves ever greater elevation and protection of these great American patriots who put their whole future and career on the line, to take their conscience to work, to protect you from dangerous products, fraudulent services, 
and corrupt government. Thank you very much, Tom Mueller. Thank you very much, Ralph. We have been speaking with Thomas Mueller, author of Crisis of Conscience, Whistleblowing in the Age of Fraud. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. When we come back, Ralph is going to answer the questions you have submitted. But first, we're going to step away for a minute and find out what is going on in the wonderful world of corporate crime with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back after this. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, November 1, 2019. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Across the nation, local and state governments have turned to utilities to address acute and pervasive infrastructure needs, while utility companies have looked to surcharges as a way to finance those projects and ensure steady profits. That's according to a report in ProPublica. Sometimes utilities have used revenue from surcharges to pay for things other than infrastructure, many of which customers might expect are already included in their rates. For example, tree trimming in Kansas, smart meters in Colorado, and pension costs in Massachusetts. In New Jersey, gas and electric bills are packed with add-ons that pay for everything from installing solar panels to putting substations on platforms above flood levels. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and we're going to answer some listener questions. And when I say we, I mean Ralph. So, David, why don't you do the honors? I think we should do Jay Goldberg's first, because it's kind of apropos to our guest. This one comes from Jay Goldberg, Ralph. He says, isn't Ralph just a little concerned that the whistleblower behind Ukraine Gate works for the CIA? I don't know what the CIA's agenda is here is, but we can be sure it's not to highlight Trump's non-enforcement of consumer, environmental, and labor protection laws. And I worry that we may be creeping towards a system where impeachment is used by elites as a means to override the will of the voters. We saw how impeachment was employed in Brazil and Paraguay to oust progressive leaders like Dilma Rousseff and Lula on bogus charges. Who's to say that if a progressive like Sanders or Warren is elected, the mere threat of impeachment couldn't be used to keep him or her in line. As awful as Trump is, and as many impeachable offenses as he's no doubt committed, the worst outcome would be to give our intelligence agencies a de facto veto over the choice of the voters. Well, that's a real risk in the future if impeachment becomes more normalized and presidents are not held accountable by informed voters, and presidents don't control the Congress. And it's something we all have to be very alert to. Hidden agendas by various groups trying to use impeachment as a way to get their own people in office and other people out of the office. But when it comes to Trump, there are many more impeachable offenses. Contempt of Congress, for example, many obstruction of justice, law enforcement, shredding the health, safety, and economic well-being laws of our federal government, pushing out scientists, crushing the oath of office to be exercised by civil servants and regulating for a more healthy and safe society, chronic lying, which has all kinds of deceptive and disabling and devious impacts on people who may believe it because it comes from the White House, incitation, violence, if Trump saying if he's impeached, maybe civil war. And that's not the first time he said that. You know, his bigotry against minorities, his misogyny against women, his disgusting personal habits, all of which violate the public trust. That was one of the definitions of an impeachable offense by Alexander Hamilton, who wanted a strong president. So when he talks about impeachable offenses, he has more credibility than maybe some of the founders who wanted a weaker president and a stronger Congress. Anyway, thanks for making that point. Rich Korn writes, Ralph, I just read that wet paper and cardboard cannot be recycled, but there is no effort on the part of the Solid Waste Authority here in Palm Beach County, Florida, to inform the public of this requirement. Isn't the whole idea of household recycling somewhat of a sham pushed by interest groups like the plastics industry and the bottled beverage industry. That way, there is no public pressure to mandate reusable beverage containers like there was 60 years ago. 
Everyone thinks we're doing something great for the environment. Meanwhile, household waste is a tiny fraction of the size of industrial waste, which is not recycled. Well, first of all, you should recall that the beverage industry continues to fight any attempt to put a five or 10 cent recycling refund for people who bring these bottles back. So they must have an attitude that doesn't quite square with your question. Over the years, they have fought people like the ecological scientist Barry Commoner tooth and nail against any kind of recycling and then using the recycled plastics to manufacture park benches, for example, and other uses. Secondly, there is a huge amount of household waste. It's not a tiny fraction of industrial waste, and it is very decentralized and exposes huge numbers of people in the process. So I wouldn't minimize household waste. And of course, we all have to go from recycling to pre-cycling. In other words, to use products like industrial hemp, which is degradable and doesn't require any fossil fuels in products like paper. Used to, in the colonial days of our country's history, the best paper was made from industrial hemp. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they grew it on their plantations. So pre-cycle, we should talk much more about. That's a preventive approach. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. And, you know, if they don't get into the radio version, they'll get into the podcast version. So you want to hang out for that. I want to thank our guests again, Thomas Muller. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call the wrap up. The transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimereporter.com. And Ralph's got two new books out, The Fable, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. To acquire a copy of that, go to RatsReformCongress.org. And To the Ramparts, How Bush and Obama Paved the Way for the Trump Presidency and Why It Isn't Too Late to Reverse Course. We will link to that also. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And try to get this program on more radio stations. Spread the word, listeners. If you like it, then you can always assume others will, too. Hi, this is Jimmy Leewert, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. And welcome to the wrap up where David gets to ask a question of Tom Mueller. Do you mind if I ask a follow up just for the podcast? No, yeah, great. Go ahead. We have a lot of right-wing corporatists who've burrowed into our agencies. Mm -hmm. So if we have, say, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren as president, what happens? Is it possible we would see the politicization of whistleblowers, what the Republicans are accusing this whistleblower of being? Well, this is the danger that we saw under President Richard Nixon of the politicization of the civil service. When you create essentially a hit squad of true believers, in every department, the next president is going to have a very, very difficult time rooting those out. Ultimately, we had to look back at the quote unquote 10 commandments that are pasted on the wall of every civil servant. And one of those commandments is to behave apolitically. And another is to report fraud, waste, abuse, and misconduct wherever they find it. So it's a professional responsibility, the phrase that Ralph Nader coined in 1971, that needs to be our lodestar, needs to be what we return to in public service. And I think the fact that corporations and big money have become just accepted, so widely accepted in politics is the root cause of this distortion. When you can have people who really are not public servants at all and never intend to be. In fact, they believe that the government should be downsized and destroyed, except that mm -hmm. part of the government which disperses their funding you've corrupted the whole concept of public service. And I think that, you know, Citizens United and that train of thought and the power of corporations in government is the root cause of so many bad things. I mean, corporations are not people and money is not speech. You know, David, you raise an important ancillary point, which is not all whistleblowers are correct or accurate or well-motivated. And that's why we have procedures to test them for their veracity and whether there's somebody behind them that's putting them up to it, 
with another agenda that's not disclosed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Ralph. And now Ralph answers more of your questions. All right. This next question comes from Ed Wittelek. And he says, Ralph, really enjoy your podcast. They are very informative and help to alleviate the boredom of long drives. Constant topic in the news is the dire situation for many corporate and government pensions. GE just recently announced that they were freezing the pensions of 20,000 of its employees. And a great many state and local pensions are woefully underfunded with Kentucky, New Jersey, and Illinois leading the pack. Have you considered having a guest on your show to outline the details of the problem and discuss where this situation is headed and if there's any viable solutions? Ellen Schultz from the Wall Street Journal wrote a book back in 2011 titled Retirement Heist. It might be worth hearing her viewpoints on this subject since it will affect millions of Americans both now and in the future. Very good suggestion, Ed. Ellen Schultz wrote a great book, as you pointed out, Retirement Heist. She's since retired from the Wall Street Journal. We'll try to locate her and have her on our show. We're talking trillions of dollars of retirement security, and there's not enough attention paid to what's being done to it, at it, against it, and for it. Thank you for that question. This next one comes from Stephen Bezrushka. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. For the last few years, U.S. life expectancy has been going down and mortality is going up. Unprecedented this century, except for Syria, where there is a war going on. The data on this are solid. The reasons debatable. I've written about this for the Harvard Health Policy Review, and he gives a link there. And he says the cost in terms of lives lost is estimated at 100,000 for 2018, but the same as deaths from traffic crashes, other accidents, and homicides. Surely this should be on the presidential debate agenda, but the media won't touch it. Similar to what happened in Russia after 1991, when inequality increased rapidly and deaths increased, but there was silence in the country. Ralph, what can be done to call attention to this carnage? Well, I try to do it when I get on the media. In fact, I mention it in a forthcoming book by Mark Green and me called Fake President, because Donald Trump's scuttling of life-saving health and safety standards, weakening pollution standards, increasing respiratory ailments, increasing cancer, weakening motor vehicle recall and other standards, unleashing lead and other heavy metals, all that increases mortality and decreases average life expectancy. So that's one. And then the second is, uh, this is where the public health profession comes in. Taken together, there are all these state public health departments are all millions of people working in public health. They really ought to pulled together on this first time in American history where average life expectancy is going down. And another reason is the opioid epidemic. That took 400,000 lives in the U.S. over the last several years. And those are some of the reasons. I'm sure you have others. But you've got to get major institutions. Shake up the American Medical Association or the Pediatrics Association. But most important, these the gigantic annual convention of the public health associations is, is a good arena for sounding the alarm here and getting uh, presidential candidates to start talking about it. It sounds next, like Mr. Bisruchka is a doctor who works for the Department of Health Services and Global Health School of Public Health at University of Washington. So I guess he knows of what he speaks there. This is from Don Stringer. He says, Mr. Nader, I'm going to do all in my power to support your demand for the ouster of Boeing CEO and board. Thank you for the fire in the belly a democracy requires of its citizens. Well, finally, the Boeing management, which should resign itself, including the board of directors, they now have a career conflict of interest with the well-being of a reformed Boeing corporation because they've dug in their heels on this disasters in Indonesia and Ethiopia, the 737 MAX, and they dug in their heels to a point where they're jeopardizing the future of the Boeing Corporation, rich as it is. But they have ousted the first top Boeing official, and his name is uh, Kevin McAllister, who ran the commercial aviation section of Boeing, which is the source of some of their largest profits. So the process is beginning, Don, and we hope some of the top officials of the FAA will re resign or be fired as well, such as Mr. Elwell and Mr. Al-Baremi. 
Next question comes from Sam Froyland, and he says, hello, Ralph and the gang, which I appreciate. I like that. We sound like a funk band, Ralph and the gang, like cool <laughs> and the gang. <laughs> so he says, tremendous fan of the show, which I also like. Thanks for all the great work you guys are doing. I am reaching out to suggest a guest that is perfect for the Ralph Radio Hour, Sharon Lerner. She's one of the best corporate crime reporters out there and has a couple of new pieces on the plastic industry, which are amazing. This is not to mention the outstanding work she has done on Teflon. Hope you could have her on soon and spread awareness about her work. All the best, Sam. Good suggestion. We'll see where Sharon Lerner works. And when the time comes for a show on Plastics will take it into consideration. This is from Eve Buckner. Next time you tell your audience to scrutinize information on the internet for accuracy, you may want to mention the public library. Research librarians will be happy to help you and supply you with current, accurate, and well-documented results. It's our job. Couldn't agree more, Eve. Thank you for pointing that out. And it can be pointed out again and again. Use the public library. Underutilization of public libraries is one of the nightmares of librarians. They're not there just to dust off books and go over their DVD supply. Very good. This next question comes from Chris Sundberg, and the subject is impeachment. And she says, why stop with Trump? George W. Bush and Richard Cheney are arguably the worst war criminals in American history. There's nothing in the Constitution that forbids impeachment once out of office. In particular, Article 1, Section 3 states that, quote, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal of office, add disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, unquote. This suggests that removal from office is not the sole remedy or punishment. Is that true, Ralph? Well, what's true is that the criminal law has a long arm and can follow George W. Bush and Dick Cheney for their criminal acts and criminal invasion of Iraq and many others, and prosecute them. In fact, the Justice Department, after Nixon resigned his office, just before he's about to be impeached in the House of Representatives on the Watergate issue in 1974, the Justice Department was preparing a criminal prosecution of our former president. And then, of course, Gerald Ford pardoned him. So not enough is being discussed, written, and urged in terms of bringing these fugitives from justice under the criminal law and prosecuting them. In fact, a conservative commentator on Fox News, Judge Napolitano, said a few years ago, what is the Justice Department waiting for? This is after Bush and Cheney left office under the Obama administration. So here is a conservative author of books on the Constitution making the point that they do not escape just because they've left office without being impeached in the House and convicted in the Senate. Isn't it true that Bush, Rumsfeld, Cheney can't really travel to Europe Mm. and maybe other parts of the world because they would be arrested? And they have that concern and they are curtailing their travel. I don't know whether it's 100 percent curtailment, but they go to a place like Spain, they could be exposed to an arrest. Yeah. You know, Caroline Kennedy in the second edition of Profiles and Courage, they they did another Profiles and Courage, and they listed Gerald Ford's pardon of Nixon as a profile in courage because it was not politically savvy, but it was good for the country. Is there any virtue to a clean slate and not relitigating the past when you're a new president? Doesn't it create perhaps a cycle of locking up the opposition and we devolve into what people call a banana republic? Well, there's, there's a risk of just revenge politics, right? Yeah. But when you're, you're dealing with a million dead Iraqis or more and millions refugees blown apart, the whole country never was a threat to us, in violation of the Constitution, Geneva Conventions, federal statutes, I don't think pursuing Bush and Cheney would have been a revenge act by Barack Obama. But you can imagine the restraints on newly inaugurated presidents, because they may say, well, it surely is going to distract attention from the agenda that the new president wants to pursue. So what? It's important to stop 
massive criminality that could rebound on our own country, boomerang, start nuclear wars because of the lawlessness. The other concern is that new presidents say, if I set the precedent of going after the previous president, what's going to deter the next president from going after the current president? So Mm -hmm. that's really what's on their mind, because Obama violated the Constitution. He violated laws right and left as well in military and foreign policy and dragnet surveillance. That's why there's this whole laundry list of impeachment articles that could be brought against Donald Trump won't be because it's been normalized from other administrations. That's quite correct. But there's so much left over compliments of the lawless Donald Trump that is more than enough (laughs) to impeach him and also turn public sentiment more and more toward impeachment. I'm reading a book about the rise of Reagan. It's fantastic. And in the book, they say you were one of the first people to call for the impeachment of Nixon after the break-in. That's right. I I was in St. Louis at the time, and it went out on AP. But there wasn't much support at that time for impeaching Nixon because everything that came out had not come out by that time. Would you have called for his impeachment had there not been the Watergate break-in? I always call for impeachment when there is systematic, repeated violation of our Constitution, because that's what the Constitution provides for. Uh, That's the essence of high crimes and misdemeanors. And when enough presidents are told that they have to take seriously their oaths to uphold the office, which they commit to at inauguration time, maybe we won't have to resort much more to that impeachable clause in our constitution. All right. This last question comes from Robin Sobolev, and he says, hi, where can I find a group, etc., and participate in, in the act of 1%? I'm traveling in between the states as a snowbird, which I guess means he does a lot of skiing, probably. I'm especially interested in none of the above option on the voting issue. Well, we have an action manual, the only one I've ever seen, on how to get none of the above enacted in your state. It's a very popular reform. Once it's explained to people, getting people to come and vote no is impossible in the U.S. That's why so many people stay home. But getting people to come to the polls and vote no confidence in the candidates on the ballot, and if it's binding and it gets more votes in a single candidate, all the candidates, there's a new election in 30 days. So if you go to uh, info at csrl.org, you can find out how to get this manual, info at csrl.org. And if you want to join an active group, go to citizen.org and join Public Citizen. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when we talk to the climate scientist who blew the whistle on the Center for Disease Control, George Luber. Until next time. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting right